Hi, my name is Morgan, and I am a PhD candidate in theater and performance studies. So I am a student, but I am also a teacher. I have acted as a teaching assistant and a course director in Canadian universities. As both a student and a teacher, I have noticed students' dependence on and identification with grades. In her recent YouTube video, How Grades Are Stopping Us From Learning, the student YouTuber Ruby Granger summarizes this mindset quite succinctly through an analysis of her own experiences in the UK education system. It was an endless cycle of perfectionism where I based my intelligence and my self-worth on the grades that I received and I know that so many other students have the exact same thing. As a student, I also experienced intense pressure to get high grades and an intense feeling of failure when I didn't. As a teacher, I see students' interest in grades over learning in almost every interaction I have. Students won't take notes or do readings unless the information will be on a test or be required for their essay. Then, after the test, they forget most of the material anyway. They will approach me after I've returned an assignment, saying they are confused by a C grade because they are an A student, or they'll ask me how they can get a better grade next time because they need to maintain their GPA. Students rarely ask me to give them more feedback or to teach them more or if they can try again, unless there will be a grade associated with that re-attempt, and only if that grade is definitely going to be better than their previous attempt. And I went through my schooling in exactly the same manner. But just because students feel or are trapped by grades, that doesn't mean they don't see the cage. Study tubers here on YouTube, like Ruby, are making videos trying to grapple with the harm caused to them by grades and how they can shift their mindset about their own education. Four years ago, R.C. Walden came out with a video called Why I Don't Care About Grades Anymore, in which he says that he literally does not care about his grades and completely ignores them because... If you are so hooked up in the academic system and grades is all you care about, Think of how much stuff you're missing out. I missed out a lot in my undergraduate degree, and I see a lot of my students missing out too. Because, as researchers have found, when extrinsic motivators like grades are dominant in a system, then there is often a loss of intrinsic motivation. I stopped reading for pleasure during undergrad, for instance, because reading stopped being fun as soon as I started having to do it for grades. Personally, I wish that I had taken R.C. Walden's approach to my education because, as he outlines in his video, I was privileged to be offered a great education, and I wish that I had approached my learning as though I actually wanted to learn instead of just because I wanted to maintain my understanding of myself as an A student. Now, instead of receiving grades, I am giving them out. And I worry that if I'm not careful, I will communicate to my students that their intelligence is only as valuable as the number that I give them, or that their learning is only worthwhile when there is a number attached to it. At the same time, I need a way to evaluate my students and to communicate that evaluation to them. I just don't think marking is the way to do that because, as has been proven many times since Ruth Butler's groundbreaking research in the 80s, when feedback on a student assignment is accompanied by a mark, students are less likely to read the feedback. So how do we communicate a student's abilities to them while ensuring that they will hear the feedback and put it into practice. Well, there is a current movement in progressive education called ungrading or degrading or going gradeless. And before you click away from this video because you think it's ridiculous that we should or even could get rid of grades entirely, let me explain. In her book, Ungrading, Why Grading Undermines Learning and What to Do Instead, Susan Bloom writes that the goal of ungrading is to, quote, question the apparent centrality of grades as an unchanging, unyielding fact of schooling, end quote. So the ungrading movement isn't trying to tell teachers or institutions exactly what they should do about the harmful impact of grades on student learning. Rather, it's just asking them to start questioning them. For over a century now, grades have been the dominant form of assessment in schools, but they are only one potential solution to the problem of assessing and communicating a student's abilities. To question the centrality of grades does not necessarily mean removing them entirely, although that is the conclusion that many educators have come to, myself included. Really, though, ungrading is a set of strategies that help reduce the harmful impact of grades on student learning. And these
Many strategies could be anything from something as small as just rephrasing the feedback you give on a student paper, to using self-assessment strategies, to getting rid of grades entirely and moving to something like a pass-fail system where instead of trying to achieve a certain grade, students rather try to achieve mastery in their subject. If we invented grading, Bloom suggests, then we can also uninvent it or invent a new system entirely. So in the rest of this video then, I would like to outline a few ways that I think grades impact student learning and ungrading strategies that might help address those concerns. Each of the concerns that I'm about to address about grading are in response to the style of assessment I saw most often during my undergraduate degree. Grades would be assigned to a small number of summative assignments, for instance, a midterm and final exam or essay, and they would be given with very little feedback and probably no formal opportunity for improvement. I have also frequently seen students being graded on a curve, so the grades themselves have no inherent meaning and only mean something in relationship to all of the other students' grades. Most of my examples will be writing or performance style assignments because that's what I'm most familiar with when teaching theater, theory, and history, but these experiments have been done in STEM classrooms as well, and if you'd like more information about that, you can check out Susan Bloom's book on ungrading. The first concern that I'd like to address is that grades are at best vague and at worst meaningless. Growing up, when I got a grade of anything less than 100% on something I brought home, let's say it was a 72%, my dad would say, where'd the other 28% go? And the thing is, oftentimes, even as instructors, we just don't know. We can't always fully explain our grading choices. Sometimes an assignment just feels like a B minus, and so we give it a 72 because that feels mid-range B minus. Or maybe we've previously marked a student's assignment that got a 70% and this one felt slightly better, so we gave it a 72. As English professor Zoe B here on YouTube puts it in their video, grading is a scam. If you've taken an algebra test, and you see you have a B plus, what does that mean? Does it mean you know all the concepts but just made a couple arithmetic errors? Does it mean you understand most of the concepts but it's just one type of question that really throws you off? Does it mean you actually understand everything, but you didn't eat breakfast that morning? Grades also vary depending on what the individual professor is looking for. For instance, when I watch a student theater piece, am I giving grades for technical acting ability, perceived effort, teamwork skills, use of innovative techniques, interpretation of the scene, whether I liked it or not, or all of the above? It can be particularly challenging to assign meaningful and consistent grades when the grading is distributed across many teaching assistants, all of whom might have different ideas about what the different grades mean. Now for some potential solutions. In this case, consider making the grades more meaningful by telling students and TAs in advance what you are assessing them for and how. Or perhaps even better, let students help you create the grading rubric for the assignment based on what they think is valuable and what they want or need to be evaluated on. This will make rubrics meaningful not only because they will be specific and transparent, but also because students might feel a sense of ownership over them. One way I've done this in my classroom is to ask not what I'm evaluating, but how much I'm evaluating it. For instance, I might give a paper and then ask the students whether they think content or style is more important for me to pay attention to while I'm grading or equally important. So should I weight content and style at a 50-50 split or a 90-10 split, etc. When I give students choice like this, they tend to respond positively because they feel as though it's a compassionate move on my part and tells them I actually care about what and how they learn. The option to give students more specific criteria for your grading though, or or let them determine that criteria does risk a heavier focus on grades. Students might end up worrying more about meeting every single criteria in the rubric and lose track of the big picture, which is the learning and growth along the way. So a different option would be to reduce the scale at which you're grading over a larger number of assignments. Instead of grading one big assignment on a hundred point scale, consider offering many smaller assignments and grade them only on like a two, three, or four point scale. The idea here is that students are 
less worried about marks on the individual assignment level, but altogether the assignments display a maybe a more accurate picture of their abilities. Plus, that way, as an instructor, you only have to decide between a three and a four, which in my opinion is a much easier decision than splitting hairs between a 71 or a 72. If you don't know how to develop rubrics, one simple method that I use stems from the ICE model of learning, which you can read about in this little fantastic book. The next concern that I want to address is that grades cause a fear of failure, and I think this is the biggest way that grades have had an impact on my life throughout schooling. When we are being evaluated on skills that we feel like we should have, our ego might kick in and we might attempt to protect our self-worth. Failing an assignment can make us feel like we are a failure. To go back to Ruby Granger's video on YouTube, I based my intelligence on the marks I was getting. Failure is integral to the learning process though. I don't expect to do well at something unless I have first failed at that thing. You know the saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again? In school, it's often more like if at first you don't succeed, you fail, because grades are given on summative rather than formative work, meaning end products rather than ongoing processes of learning. In 1978, Susan Harder studied children's approaches to challenging activities. All of the children were allowed to choose an activity they participated in, but half were told it was a game, and the other half were told it was for a grade. The half that were not graded chose more challenging activities and verbally expressed less anxiety than the group who believed they were being graded. So when students are ungraded, they actually might take more risks and experience less stress. Paul Freebukes and Butera argue that grades come along with significant social and esteem-based present and future consequences for students and since the power to assign grades is not in their hands, this puts them in a position of dependence and powerlessness. This leads to challenge avoidant and performance avoidant behaviors, which means that students choose easier work that won't risk demonstrating their perceived incompetence. In other words, grades create students who do everything they can to avoid failure. To be competent though, you need to first be incompetent. If you go into a class expecting to already know everything, you'll almost definitely learn nothing. But being bad at things is really uncomfortable, and the way we grade means being bad at things has severe negative consequences potentially for the student's entire life. How can we reward students for their attempts and their perseverance through discomfort rather than failing them when their first attempt is bad? One option is to offer students many assignments or attempts at tests and then let students choose the ones they want to submit for a grade. So over the course of a term, maybe you assign eight journal assignments, but only six of them are going to be graded. Or maybe you grade all eight of them, but you only assign the six best marks. This is more similar to a mastery model of learning in which students are expected to master a learning goal before they are evaluated and can move on to the next goal. Alternatively, you could offer some grading free zones. These are sections of a course in which assignments are given, but they are totally un graded. This gives students an opportunity to take as many risks as they'd like and fail as much as they need to without punishment. You could also make these periods totally uncritiqued so students don't even have to worry about negative comments on their work and they can just truly learn and experiment without judgment. This could even be done at the class to class level. Instead of just lecturing for two hours straight, consider taking the first 15 minutes of each class for students to take a test or write a reflection on the course content and then take it up immediately or review some of the reflections immediately so they can get frequent practice and feedback on the new skills that they're developing. Another option that I personally haven't tried is contract grading, and this is where students sign up for their grade at the beginning of the course, and then they don't have to worry about achieving that grade as long as they do everything that's in the contract. For instance, maybe a B grade requires a performance, and the A version of the grade requires a performance and a personal artistic reflection. So if a student knows that they don't have very much time to dedicate to this course this semester and they're happy just getting a B, then they'll just do the performance. Whereas if another student has more energy and they really need an A in this course, then they can sign up for that A grade. And as long as they do those things, they'll get that grade. They don't have to stress about the grades. Now, I haven't personally tried this technique and that sounds nice in theory, but I worry that it might just make students and teachers far too grade obsessed again, especially if teachers are going to be docking marks for the quality of each task. And I worry that it doesn't take quality of content mastery into account as much as quantity of tasks completed, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. If I'm wrong about that, feel free to correct me in the comment section below. The next concern I want to address is one that always frustrated me growing up.
growing up and that I always tried to resist in my classrooms, and that is that grades promote competition. In their paper on achievement motivation, John G. Nichols explains that we can conceive of ability in two ways. We can either look at a student's ability by referencing their past performance or knowledge, which means that they have to develop mastery at a topic over time to indicate competence, or we can imagine ability as something that is relevant to the abilities of others, which means that high ability is not just about mastery, but also comparison between students. Grades are often assigned at higher education institutions in Canada, not with a student's past or current performance in mind, but rather with the performance of their peers in mind. In this case, a student's mastery of a subject is only valuable insofar as it's more masterful than their peers. In other words, it's in every student's best interest for other students to do worse than them. So how do we resist this? Well, one option is to resist the grading curve. If your school requires an even distribution of grades for every class, you can likely submit documentation explaining the reason for your uneven distribution of grades, arguing that it's unique to your current students' abilities. If you can't get away from a predetermined distribution of grades, I'm not really sure any better methods for reducing competition in the classroom. If you can though, then I can think of a couple more ways. One option might be peer assessment. Yes, grades are still a threat of punishment in this case, but at least the power dynamic in the classroom gets shifted, and instead of everyone depending on the professor, they now have to depend on each other. In 2019, a meta-analysis was done on the impact of peer assessment on academic performance, and although most studies on peer assessment focus on subjective perceptions of the practice rather than its actual effect on academic performance, they did find that peer assessment is more effective than no assessment and teacher assessment. Peer and teacher scores when assessing students tend to be comparable to each other, and in the case of peer assessment, students get to benefit from both assessing and being assessed. Peer assessment is particularly good for providing formative assessments and feedback because it is quick, effective, and doesn't require the professor to attend to every individual student. This also frees up the professor's time to support the students most in need of assistance. If you're concerned about student bias in their feedback and assessment, you could anonymize the assignments. I've used this in the case of student group performances where everybody in the audience is given a small, simple rubric to fill out so that it's not just my opinion that is going into the grade of the quality of this performance, and because the success or failure of a theater production typically is determined by the audience. And then to assess students' teamwork within the groups, I will let every member of the group assess every other member of the group. Because realistically, I cannot sit in and witness everything that's happening in every group, and so to some extent I have to put some of my trust in them to assess each other. Another option might be self-assessment. In this case, the student only has themselves to compete against. And finally, you could grade a little bit more for improvement over time. This is actually, I learned later, what my first year drama teachers did for my class. They gave the same assignment three times over the course of a year. On the first assignment, I got a C. I was devastated. On the second assignment, I got a B. And then when I got an A plus on the third assignment, I felt so good. I felt like the only person responsible for my success was me. And if I worked hard enough, I would do better at something. And this was not only because I saw the improvement over time, but also because there was a clear outline of what success looked like and each attempt was provided with feedback. So I saw myself taking the feedback and getting a better grade, but all of that does require a lot more attention on individual students students, and in very large classrooms, maybe you don't have that luxury. And the final concern that I want to address is that students don't take feedback when there is a grade attached to it. In the 1980s, Ruth Butler randomly assigned 5th and 6th graders to three different feedback conditions. All students completed a task, and then they received either a grade, a comment, or both for the task. Butler was measuring for interest and performance at all stages of the experiment, and found that students who received only a comment without a grade experienced the highest levels of both interest and performance. So how can we mimic those results in our classrooms when we have no choice but to assign grades? The grading-free zones that I mentioned earlier might work in this case. I've also heard of teachers withholding grades from students until the very end of a course. This, like most of these strategies, requires trust in the teacher by the students, which comes from the teacher being very clear in explaining why and how they are withholding grades. And another strategy might be a collaborative grading style in which you work with the student to determine a grade. You might, for instance, offer only feedback without a grade when returning the student's assignment, and then have the student determine the grade, considering 
gathering that feedback. Or you could conduct one-on-one -on -one meetings with students where you determine the grade together based on your verbal feedback. Or you could move to a fully self-graded model and have students assign themselves a grade and an explanation for that grade. After reading the explanation, you can choose to disagree and meet with the student to discuss if necessary. Jesse Stemmel is one of the most outspoken promoters of the ungrading movement on the internet, and he has been ungrading for over 20 years. His blog is one of the best starting points to learn about ungrading, and self-assessment is his ungrading method of choice. In a blog post on how to ungrade, he writes that he has students write self-reflections two to three times throughout the term. The first of these is usually more directed with specific questions than the last, which opens up into something more like an essay. One of the biggest backlashes you might get with self-grading is that students might feel like you're just asking them to do your work for you. But one of Stamel's goals with the self-evaluation is for students to do metacognitive work, meaning learning about learning. If students are to succeed outside of school, then they need to be able to learn on their own and determine the success of that learning. On one writing assignment last year, I offered students a flexible option for grading. So they could either put full trust in me to give them a grade based on my understanding of their success in the assignment criteria, or they could do fully self-graded where they gave themselves a grade and they determined the grading criteria, or they could set up a meeting with me where one-on-one -on -one we would discuss their assignment and determine a grade together. And when they self-graded, if I disagreed with their grade, then I would set up a meeting with them so that we could discuss the discrepancy. Sometimes teachers worry that self-grading will just result in extremely inflated grades because why not give yourself an A regardless of what you did? But I find that students are usually honest with themselves and with me me, especially if I say that if I disagree with what they've given themselves, they have to set up a meeting with me. For me, last year, this flexible grading option was like the best of all worlds. The assignments I had to grade went quickly because I wasn't concerned that students would disagree with my assessment because they had already given up the opportunity to choose their own grade and had entrusted the grade to my expertise. The assignments students graded themselves also went quite quickly for me because they had already done all of the work and it was done with such care and deep reflection, so I just got to offer my sincere feedback to them and I was fairly certain they would read it because they weren't worried about the grade I was going to give. And the assignments where I got to personally discuss student assignments with them one-on-one -on -one were the most fulfilling for me because I got to work with those students to discuss what they could improve on and create unique improvised grading solutions in real time with them. There are many more ungrading strategies, so if you're interested in this, I absolutely recommend you go and do your own research. One really compelling method I didn't mention here is the portfolio method, where students just give a portfolio of their work at the end of the year. Personally, I've never tried that technique, so I don't know how well it works, and I have limited teaching opportunities, so you'll want to experiment with these things on your own or read other teachers' accounts. If you are worried about the impact of grades or your teaching choices on student learning, though, then the best thing you can do is professional development. That might include watching videos like this one, reading books and articles like the ones linked in the description box below, attending workshops through your university, reflecting on your teaching practices, asking asking students for their feedback on your teaching, and experimenting regularly in the classroom. I think we should do away with grades entirely, but I also know that it comes along with a lot of issues and might not be the best solution. Typically, ungrading strategies do mean more work for the teachers, but usually the work that you do complete is more fulfilling for the teachers and more valuable for the students. What I do know all of us in the education system can do now, teachers and students alike, is question the centrality of grades in our approach to teaching. If you liked this video, consider liking it and sharing it with your networks. That helps my channel reach more folks. If you have tried on grading and you want to share your strategies below or your opinions on what I've said here, then please let me know in the comment section below. If you are struggling to implement ungrading strategies, then feel free to put those struggles in the comment section below as well, and I'll do my best to respond to them, or somebody else with more experience than me might be able to help you out. This video was made for the York University Teaching Commons blog, and it will be accompanied by a short blog post, which I will link in the description box below. And there is a written version of this video, so if you would also like to consume this content in that format, then you can follow my Medium page. That's all from me for today. I hope that you can take something away from this video that you can start implementing in your teaching in the next class that you teach, maybe even, or in the next syllabus that you write. Let's keep the conversation going in the comments, and I'll see you in another video soon.